Hello, and welcome to this afternoon's BFI Film Academy Lab. My name is Julia Andrews Clifford, and I'm the Young Film Programmers Network Manager. And it is my pleasure to be introducing today's event on music documentaries. Um, BFI Film Academy Labs are online webinars for young filmmakers and young film programmers to gain tips and advice from professionals working in the industry already. And so how today's session is gonna run, we are gonna have half an hour interview between our young film programmer, presenter and our guests. And then it will be over to you to quiz the guests yourselves. You can put your questions in the Q&A at any time and get thinking about that as soon as we begin, but at five o'clock it's gonna be over to you. So the first half is us, the second half is you. Uh, there are closed captions for those of you who'd like them, if you would like to click the button at the bottom of your screen. And finally, to say a little bit about why we decided to do the event today. So music documentaries are a really, we think, great way in for new young audiences to come along to your events or venue. Um, and Doc and Roll Film Festival the Doc and Roll Film, our guests today, seem to be the leaders in this in the country. So we are really chuffed to have them today. But before we bring them on, um, I'd like to introduce our presenter and interviewer today, Uche Odu. Hi, Uche, thanks for coming. Hi, Julia, thanks for having me. Great, and so a little bit about Uche. So, um, she is running her own independent young film programmer group called Nollywood Film Club and is passionate about bringing Nigerian cinema to new audiences in the UK. Originally from Nigeria and also a filmmaker and a photographer. So welcome. Thank you so much. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'm excited about this session. My name is Uche Odo. I'm a director, I'm a producer, and I'm also a photographer. And I currently run Nollywood Film Club with the intention of introducing Nollywood films to new audiences. So I'm looking forward to connecting to everyone here. My pronouns are she and her. And yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to have you. And you have reminded me that I forgot to self-describe. So. I am also a woman. I'm a white woman, middle-aged with long brown gray hair and I'm wearing purple glasses. And my pronouns are she and her. So, thanks Uche. Uche will be interviewing our guest today. So I'd like to introduce Vanessa and Colum from Doc and Roll Films. And they, they might come out from the wings in our wonderful uh, online way. Hi, welcome. Thanks for joining Hi, thanks us for today. Us. Hello. So a little bit about our guests and about Doc and Roll Film Festival. Um, so first of all, Doc and Roll Film Festival has been running for nine years and we are so grateful that you have shown up today because they have just finished their ninth edition with 11 venues across the UK and are probably completely exhausted. So we really appreciate getting you in this little downtime to give us some insight into what you do and why you do it. So um, before, um, just to say a little bit, maybe just to introduce yourselves before we watch the trailer for this year's festival highlights. Good, so I'm Vanessa and I'm the co-director. Um, uh, um, my pronouns are she, her, I'm 45 years old, white woman with blonde, um, blonde hair, wearing glasses and a blue jumper. Hi, my name is Colin Ford. I'm a white guy in his 40s. I'm wearing a striped jumper. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. And I'm the artistic director and co-founder of Doc and Roll Films. Awesome. Thank you. And it's really great that you're in the same room. It shows how, you know, it's, it's sort of co-directors and co-partners have to work closely together. So I love that. <laughs> so if we could ask to see the trailer to give our viewers a little sort of taste of what this year's festival was all about. This was the beginning. I didn't understand 
how this was going to have an impact on the future. If it wasn't for songs like these, there would have been no hip hop. I got to do something with that. Golly, is it, is it like Bon Jovi? And I go, no, it's not. Offending half the theater and the other half's going nuts. I'm not strong enough to quit. I can't. I had no idea how amazing he was. To me, they were the British Slack supergroup that never, ever happened. Omar, 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 Omar. The invention of Willie DeVille is a great work of art. It was just off on the track. Later on, a multiracial band from South Africa and five actually existing together as a band and living under the same roof, they're breaking the law. The sex pistol on shit on me! That was the moment I realised that you're just going to have to fucking give your dream up. Absolutely key in the development of my musical career. I mean, sometimes you just gotta cut loose. One, two, sorry. Go, yeah, go. It's just stuck. We're gonna have to do this walk in every time. I, lo I love the ending of that. And so, before uh, that give you a flavor, it looks awesome the amount of films and the amount of under the radar music documentaries that were shown, not your normal run of the mill. And uh, how, oh, sorry, I've lost my thread. I got excited about it. <laughs> and um, before I hand over to Uche, just to say a bit more about Vanessa and Colm. Colm. So uh, Vanessa Lovan Garcia is Spanish originally, comes from Barcelona. Uh, this is significant for later. And um, she's the co-director of Doc and Roll Film Festival. She oversees the whole festival and project manages 13 teams and is a female led film agency. So there'll be some questions maybe around that in the very male dominated music business. Um, she's also been a project manager for 18 years and has an MBA, which is a master's in business administration. So we'll get a bit more low down on her background in a minute, but I just wanted to also, uh, tell you a little bit about Colm Ford's background too, which is also quite checkered. Um, co-director and co-founder of Doc and Roll Films, now the head of acquisitions and sales, as well as the uh, creative programmer. And as in 2019, I'm guessing through COVID, launched Doc and Roll TV. But before that, 12 years at Radio Television Air, which is the Irish broadcasting, national broadcasting company, and two years at the London Screen Archives. So welcome all, such a lot of experience, such a lot of varied experience. Thank you for joining us and I'm gonna hand over to Uche. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, for that fantastic introduction. The trailer looks amazing. And just to start off with, just tell us what is Doc and Roll Film Festival? So Dock and Roll Film Festival is the UK's music talk fest, so dedicated exclusively to music documentaries. So we have this headline festival every November that is in London, but as you can see in other 13 UK cities, so 14 cities in total. And after that, after we have all of these festivals, then we start doing one year, um, one off events during the year. And Colm, we distribute some of the titles that we have in our festival. Wow. Okay. Colm, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, our year round activity uh, extends beyond one offs as well. Like sometimes we have films that are come into us but they can't fit into our November rigid slots and they need to be premiered yeah. some other time of the year or in another city that doesn't suit the filmmaker to just come to London so we are across uh, 14 cities in total with the festival structure but um we are we also do 
seasonal programming for music or sorry for yeah music festivals in the summertime like Glastonbury and we out here Jaws Peterson's new festival he started uh, about three or four years ago and also uh, All Points East in Victoria Park we do community screenings there and that's kind of July August activity when we want to stay away from the cinemas because it's quite difficult to get people in during the summer so we also have some programming for regional hotels that have screening rooms. So these are all different sources of income that keep us busy throughout the year and kind of keep us fresh as well, because we're not all focused on just delivering one particular type of event or one particular type of uh, season or whatever theme seasons. We also work with universities as well with the College of Fashion to do screenings associated with their subculture courses and that kind of thing. So it's a whole mix. Yeah. Nice, nice. So during Julia's introduction, something stood out for me. Like for me, I have a background in film. I have a diploma in TV and film production. I have a master's in TV and film production, but I see that you guys have like varied experiences. Like you yeah. used to work as a textile engineer, Colum works in archive, used yeah. to work at the archive you know so i want to know what were some of the steps that led up to starting the docker room film festival yeah well i i think it's because for example in my case i didn't have clear what i wanted to do but you know when i needed to study i'm the youngest of uh, four and I was the first one to go to college. I'm coming from a, a working class uh, background. So in my family, when I was like the first to choose to go to, to college, to university, it was like, no way I can study arts. It was like, I need to make money. I need to make, you know, it's the kind of like, I don't know, thing that you have to be your family, you know, making a, a studies that will, you know, have some job and make money in the future. So I studied to be a, a engineer and I choose the textile because it sounds more fashionable and I thought okay I'm from Barcelona this sounds you know the coolest of the engineers then I discovered that was not the case you know it's nothing about fashion it's about repairing machines in a, in a factory and working in production in factories anyway wow. so it was well because when I finished um, college straight away I got a job in Louis Vuitton I worked there for uh, several years where I managed, you know, uh, big teams of 50 people. Like it was a big challenge because it was some of the women were older than me, like half, you know, I was half of their age. So it was overwhelming in some cases, but I learned a lot. And this is helped me in the future. You know, I didn't see at that time. I just like worked really long hours. It was super stressful. But this, you know, in is a type of production where you have to work really fast. Things have to be finished. So things it relates later to make it, you know, to do a film festival. But I didn't know at that time. So I decided after several years that that was not what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in music. So I was like, I don't know music but in where you know what I'm going to do in the music industry I'm not a singer I don't know what to do so I decided the first step was to learn English because I found that was really important for the industry so I moved to America and after America I moved to Ireland where I met Colum and then I started our trips we travel a lot we went to South America for nine months then Barcelona then Ireland until we finish in here in the UK because it makes sense for both of us it was like finding I knew that I wanted to do uh, to start my own company I did a master's on business administration so it's something that I had really clear during after when I finished my engineering I say I want to do a business course because I know that's so what I do but I didn't know what kind of business so that was my thing it was like finding during all of these years you know what I was going to do in the industry finding something that I was really passionate about it and I think you know music was you know something I wanted you know to do so and I pass it to Colin yeah, so my background, um, initially I started, uh, I, was a, I was always a fan of history, documentaries, um, wildlife documentaries, all types of different documentaries. And I had um, an interest in filmmaking as a 15, 16, 17 year old. So I ended up doing a BA in communications and uh, that was in Dublin where I'm from. And part of that uh, final year involved one month's work experience, which I was lucky enough to get my foot in the door of the National Broadcast Archive for a month and uh, mm. gave me a taste 
of post-production and working within the TV industry to a certain extent. And then uh, once I had graduated, um, an opportunity opened up in uh, that same archive. So I started on the floor and I spent the best part of 12 years there working my way up to finally leading restoration teams and training other people to handle film, to grade film and to restore film. And in the middle of all of that, I took um, a two year career break. Uh, Vanessa mentioned traveling to South America. We did that during that period. I relocated to Barcelona for a year and worked there, I learned Spanish, a little bit of Catalan. And then I went back to my job in the archives for a year or so. Uh, did a bit of training then. I trained in uh, the FIF Summer School Restoration Course, which is an international film restoration course in Bologna in 2011. And then in 2012, I, I did some training and archiving in Paris in ENA as well, which is a national broadcaster there. And then uh, I took a redundancy after working 12 years in that position and I was looking for something else. So we decided to relocate to London as a kind of central point between our two countries and backgrounds. And um, before we did that, we traveled to Southeast Asia and India uh, for six and a half months and made the most of that break. Uh, uh, broadened our horizons that way to say the least. And then uh, we both arrived here in 2013. And after me being unemployed for some time, we decided to set up uh, Doc and Well film festival just to combine our mutual interest in left of field film indie film left of field and alternative music across all genres whoa i love that so what stood out for me here is the passion and the travel and finding your niche i like how you've been able to tie it together to start doc and roll film so i'm gonna just go right into doc and roll um festival now so how do you um, attract young audiences to watch these music documentaries? Like, why is the music documentary, why are music documentaries attractive, like, to young audience? I think it's not more about the music documentary. It's about the music. It's about the artist. Mm -hmm. It's about the story that you're going to tell. And I think music connects with all the ages, you know, everybody, you know, you, that's a matter of the age. So you can connect with really young audiences if you program, you know, artists that they will be interested in. As well, when you program a music documentary short pro, uh, music docs, you know, you get more interest, you know, on that as well. But mainly it's about the artists. Mm. What's the, what kind of events, I know you just wrapped up the Doc and Roll Film Festivals, like what kind of events do you do around promoting these music documentaries? Also, what was your highlight, or let me start with, what was your highlight of the just concluded Doc and Roll Film Festival? I don't know, do you want to say your highlight? Um, well, at first I'd say to begin with, in terms of the type of events that we structure around the film screenings is we always try to have an in-person Q&A from the filmmaking team, which may be the director or the producer, and also some of the mm -hmm. instigators, or if at all possible, somebody, uh, the artists that are be involved in the story, like, you know, particularly, of course, if they're British artists, we can easily get them to London or whichever city it may be out of the 14 we work with. Um, so we always add that level of engagement, which is, you know, is pretty obvious, but it's it's very enticing to an audience, no matter what age, to have a background of the story of what they've just seen, particularly from a few different angles, if we can have two people on the panel, which is a filmmaker and maybe the sound engineer or the editor or one of the artists themselves to tell their background and story and how they feel about the film that they've just seen. Uh, in addition to that, we like to warm up the venue, maybe with a DJ set associated with the themes in the film or the record labels that are covered there or you know the cross-cultural themes within the film. So maybe a, a mixture of different types of ethnic music depending on the, the film. And that would be after the Q&A as well. So a bit of both sides of the event. And if at all possible, we try to do some live music events, usually in a nearby venue, which is complicated, but it really adds value. Mm -hmm. um, then in terms of highlights of this year's festival, we had um, 
21 premiere screenings uh, wow. of new films, all different varieties, world premieres, UK premieres, European premieres across all genres of music, jazz, funk, soul, hip hop, and everything in between. Uh, one of the highlights would have been the sellouts that we had. We had 10 sellouts in London across, I think we did 24 screenings with 21 films and we showed them yeah. twice. Uh, one of those was um, a premiere in the Ritzy in Brixton in Screen One with 350 people of a film about a band called Simande from Brixton, which is a funk band from the mid to late 70s. And uh, it was beautiful to have a real family affair there. We had all the surviving band members, which was six people plus their new band members. And that was 10 people on stage, including two uh, hosts to handle the, the eight uh, band members. So that was a fantastic event where there was all age groups. A lot of uh, grandchildren were there, nieces, nephews, uncles and aunts and cousins from the band members and the filmmakers. So it was a beautiful, warm event. And then we had a DJ set afterwards, which was associated with the music and the band themselves within the film next door. That's a- that sounds really interesting. Now I wish I was there. <laughs> so what I noticed, yeah, of course. What I noticed um, when we were playing the trailer is how um, there are under the radar um, artists that, you know, not mainstream artists that we know. How is that important to you and Doc um, and Roll Film Festival to like work with like, um, let me say female artists, you know, female filmmakers, how important is that to doc a role? We want to give the voice to all of those that they have not been here in the music industry. It's like, so, and, you know, marginalized voices in, in yeah. you know, this is really important for us and try to open those doors for those that they were not here. So as a woman, for me, it was really important to have more women in a, you know directors and represent more women but it's like I realized that it doesn't matter it's about like representing all the minorities all the people yeah. that struggle to be in the industry as well and as we see music is really male dominant uh, dominant and as well I see the same in the film I know film is changing more but the music industry is still like you know yeah there is the artist but behind that there's still a lot of men so um so yeah it's trying to help and change that and that was the main thing as well when I started a company is doing something things that you know you're passionate about it but that you can do some changes as well in the industry and shape it up and make you know so that was really important for us and in terms of like the artists that we choose it's like yeah maybe they're under rather to the main audiences but not mm-hmm. to the you know or audience or audience are yeah. really like passionate about music they love all of these these disco- and we have so many people that comes to discover music so maybe they don't know the artist but it's like the music is what is going to tell you this story but behind that is so many things that you can tell and it's incredible because sometimes you watch a music documentary and if you watch that in a film you will say ah that can never happen you know i don't believe it in a future film it's like never happen and then you watch it in a documentary it's like that that's real and you know you will never say that that things can happen yeah so is this telling a story about human beings yeah I love that I love that um how do you work with the musicians I would want to know like how do you work with these musicians how do you work with the filmmakers what relationship do you have with them that they are able to entrust you with their films to program for your film festival and to distribute Um, Well, when we started out, um, I spent the vast majority of my time researching and sourcing films. Um, Thankfully, after about four to five years of existence, um, I no longer had to chase up so many films. And we set up a platform for submissions on Film Freeway. And thankfully, at that stage, about five years ago, we were receiving probably 70% of our program via that channel. And then the further 30%, I was researching myself across other international festivals and particularly on social media at the time. Facebook was really important. Now it's much more uh, Instagram. But uh, looking at 
music and film groups on Facebook, independent uh, and alternative music groups within Facebook of all genres and all niche genres, because what we do, as explained, is really off the main center ground of mainstream music. So um, social media is great for that. You know, it, 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 it particularly in Facebook at the time, it attracted a lot of niche um, interest groups. And also Reddit is a great place as well to find niche interest groups and forums to, to talk about these artists. And then I would find some of those contributors would mention a film that's being made. And then I would search that up and find that and get directly in touch with the filmmaker, either via their socials or via LinkedIn, or uh, depending on the situation, maybe they might have a sales team in terms of a, a distributor or a world sales person. And it's basically a, a lot of um, heavy niche research really. Uh, but once I would get in touch with the filmmakers, I would always arrange um, a Skype chat with them. This is back in the day before Zoom existed. So I was undermining our competitors in a big time because I was spending a lot of time building a uh, relationship with the filmmakers before the bigger festivals would get in touch with them because I was doing uh, this probably seven to eight to 10 months before the other film festivals would uh, think about getting in touch with them via email. So I was creating camaraderie and a kind of a, a genuine um, understanding of their struggles because these films are passion projects that can take seven to 12 years to get out. They're, they're basically done by part-time filmmakers who have full-time jobs. And there was a lot of correlation between their backgrounds and our backgrounds because we worked a lot in part-time jobs to launch the company over the first six years to pay the rent and bring in the food bills and all of that. So there was an instant recognition from my, my side in terms of reaching out to these people who would be at some times amazed that I found them in the first place because um, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be known in the film or music industry so it was a lot of background um work that would pay off eventually probably seven yeah years. yeah okay thank you so much this has been an amazing conversation and session and just to wrap it up things that stood out for me is you discovering that with your passion you can find a niche and use it to create a festival and I really like that the both of you are non-British citizens, but you're still able to still work in this space and create like valuable opportunities for filmmakers and musicians. So thank you so much for this. And I'm going to hand it over to Julia now um, to thank our you. question and answer. And yeah. yeah. Thank you, Che. Thanks, Uche. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Following up from that, I mean, it sounds a bit like, okay, that's interesting. All three of you, and you know, one of the reasons it came out and was kind of interesting is being outsiders in mm. some respect absolutely. and finding a niche. I'd like my, uh, I first of all want to say to the audience, now is the time to start putting your questions in the Q&A. Um, but until we get some, we're going to keep asking. So please get your thinking caps on and get those questions out there. But my question would be, what have been some of the difficulties that you face? Mm. Because in some ways it's like, it can feel a little bit like, you know, you, you come on this webinar already successes, you know, it's like, oh, nine years, 11 venues, success, success, the accolades, you know, the CV. And it's a bit like, you know, it was an overnight success, but sometimes, you know, in interviews like this, it can feel like that. And, I, and I'm often drawn also to that, um, the old pulp, you know, Jarvis Cocker thing, where it's like everyone thought it was an overnight success, but he'd been working on it his entire life before the overnight success. Absolutely. So yeah. What have been some of the difficulties that you face well, along the way? Paying the rent? Yeah. <laughs> Starting a company is really difficult. In London, the London overheads are a killer. 
Yeah. So you have to be really passionate about what you're going to do, because if you want to start a company in something and you have to work so many hours, you have to commit to something that you're going to be passionate about it. Because if you're like half, I like this, you know, like it's horrendous. Like we are passionate about it. And sometimes it's like get it fed up because it's so much work. It's incredible. And it was really hard the first few years because mm. you feel like understanding the business. You never organize a festival. So the first festival is a challenge, but the second one is even more because it's like, okay, what's going to be next? How are we going to grow this? How are you going to connect with people? So it's all of this that, you know, during the years, you know, you you start to go to courses and you start to meet. Like, I think it's super important that we, from the beginning, we have been going to um, parties. <laughs> yeah, the Film London uh, breakfast to meet people, ICO courses. So all of this has been really like crucial, like and as well, because you're starting a business in a country where like you don't know like how things works every country is different like I used to a master's to start a company in Spain but in here things are different so mm -hmm. this is like get around all like and it's, it's it's a big challenge and then to get films and people trust you so it's just a building of like hours and hours and committing and decide and you know sacrifice things like not going on holidays so it's yeah success and we are like knowing 11 venues we are in 25 venues we have 115 events in the festival but this year I think in total it's going to be more than 300 events organized because for the whole year for the whole year so yeah. it's a lot of work and we are a really a small company uh mm. so yeah it's a challenge as well in terms of man hours what you can do and you want you can do you know so yeah that's yeah. that's or woman hours you know and i think you know to throw that to uche you know you're just yeah. starting out uh, yeah how many you know how many years do you feel Thing. take to build up to an income from it yeah I'm, I'm not going to put a specific number of years to it I just want to learn as I'm growing and like it's not just about me and I, I'm not thinking about it for the money you know I want to create opportunity for other filmmakers so not just me um, I want to give an opportunity to other filmmakers to show their work and like Nollywood is like the third biggest producing film industry in the world. And a lot of people don't even watch Nollywood film. So I have a mission first to introduce Nollywood to the audience. So I'm, I know it's going to be tough. <laughs> I know it's going to be tough, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by their journey. I'm inspired by Colin and Vanessa's journey. And this is just motivating me to just keep at it, you know? Yeah. So I'm looking forward to all the challenges and the experiences um by the way yeah so amazing yeah and i think i mean would you column have a sort of uh approximate number of years that you were unemployed while you were building up this company or in another job you you know you referred to like not the day job yeah so well i was... when was the tipping point where it became the day job oh that took some time to say the least um I'd say the tipping point was probably, what, five years in, really, because to be honest, um, we were, you know, I mean, I was I was uh, on on benefit, unemployment benefit, setting up a startup company, you know, and that went on for quite some time, so at least, you know, um, and then doing some part time work within that sphere, uh, whatever could be, you know, allowed within those hours. And also, uh, just to mention what Vanessa, or to, to back up what Vanessa mentioned in terms of making connections and building a network, that was absolutely vital because we both arrived here with uh, zero connections in the arts world as well. Um, so what we have achieved is quite significant considering that, you know, we didn't have anyone to open a door for us. We had no friends who were working in TV, film, or music industries, we have quite a large group of friends here, but none of them were in the in the arts world or particularly doing live events or anything. So we had to start from scratch on that front. And it was all really about uh, working a full day and then going out to 
music events or film events or networking events within both or one, either the film industry or the music industry or the exhibition industry in terms of going to other um, fe established festivals, uh, networking events, or like uh, Vanessa mentioned, Film London Hub uh, breakfast events every quarter. That was really interesting to meet other exhibitors who were doing uh, similar things to us in terms of their niche value and getting some advice from them directly from people who had already tried to do these things in different parts of London. And then, um, yeah, it was basically a culmination of all of that hard work and sacrificing the evenings and weekends for three to four to five years uh, and building a web of networks across exhibitors, distributors, and music uh, promoters, and also venue owners, music venue owners, and all, uh, bands and musicians and managers, and all of that bigger picture, and music labels, and combining all of that together, after about five or six years, it became a it became a full time job. You know, amazing. I want to ask you another question on that, but the the questions are, are filling up, so I'm going to shift to those now. So in relation to that, Roderick uh, has asked, do you offer any internships, schemes or work experience? Because obviously your team, how big is your team? And do you have internships or work experience yeah. opportunities? Yes. Yeah. So we started always like from the beginning, having volunteers in regular basis for the festival. And then these start like to come people that they want to learn how to, you know, to run a festival and having different expertise. So we have been training, you know, young uh, programmers. So we had Hester for like two years, uh, training her in short uh, programming. And now she got the job. She's in a young Chinese uh a student a student uh, yeah. yeah yeah so she come on board and now she got a, a i think an internship in the barbican yeah. so yeah so it's just giving the opportunity to people like they and then we have another uh, normally it's people that they send us emails and say i went to this screening and i love it and it's just like really young people like you know i had like this girl that was like 17 she came to a screening in the ica and then she emailed me and it was amazing email she said she came on her own and that was her passion music documentaries and she wanted to learn how to you know to produce events and then we train her uh, to get you know jobs you know doing organizing events so it's just like you know yes of course we train people uh that they're passionate about you know and they want to learn of course that's the key. amazing so is there is there an email maybe in the chat we can yeah. put an email i mean that's a bit maybe a bit pushy but maybe you have to be a bit pushy you know, yeah. in this way, yeah. and maybe you can have a waiting list or whatever. So that I think that would be great yeah. if we could do that in the chat, please. Yeah, yeah sorry, Colin. No, I was going to say, I mean, that's that's being pushy is what it's all about, really. You know, we, we, <laughs> we, were, we were pushy in every respect in trying to build our networks. And uh, we were really interested in people with passion and not that interested in people who have an interest because those people with an interest are just going to fall by the wayside after their interest dries up and they just don't put in their full mm. efforts, you know? So that's where we're really looking for people who, uh, you know, off, get off their own steam and basically get in touch with us, check out the website, find the contact info, info at, and there you go, straight away you're in, you know? Uh, yeah. Rather than us having to advertise, you know? Yeah. If you know what I mean? We're yeah. looking for people who will make the first... Uh, step and then I'll jump on a Zoom with them for 30 minutes or a phone call and scope them out and scope out their interests and their passions and take it from there. Yeah. And what I wanted to say, the majority of the people that they started in our festival in the first year as a volunteers, they have been going now and they're like working as a freelancers for the company. Uh, so it's about, yeah, it's about developing events. as well yeah. the people. It's not about like, you know, we treat, we understand that film festivals, some people, enjoy, but I treat it as a business. So we have this business and this business has, you know, certain amount, we understand that we need volunteers for the film festival in general, the people that will be there helping the usher, giving forms but there are all the people that they want to learn how to run the events how to do things in the future for themselves so we want and we take it serious because we yeah. think that, you know this is the way to start and then you can you know progress and get a paid job which i think awesome and, you know it's interesting because uche we might be working to get you 
an internship with Mauna Film Festival. So, and there's a lot of talk about that in the network at the moment about internships. And obviously they can have bad press, but not if it's a truly sort of symbiotic relationship where it's mutually beneficial and you get to build your capacity. And I think it's interesting what you said, Colm, about interest, because you know, you have to get something out of it. I just wanted to catch up on what you were saying there. It's like, what do you mean by that? Do you mean interest as in money? Like they think it's a niche and they're going to, or you mean it's got to be more than an interest, it's got to be a passion. Yeah, what, I, what yeah. I actually meant was they're only interested. Yeah. Rather than okay. passionate yeah. about. Right. Because there is a saying, I don't know who said it, but it's like somebody who's passionate about it in, your, in a particular field, having that person in your team is far better than having 10 people who are interested because yeah. those 10 people will fall by the wayside and yeah. lose them. So, Mm -hmm. uh, people don't lose passion passion is yeah. a term. less is more maybe uh, sometimes yeah. Yeah, that's vital really uh, within any industry but particularly within uh film and music industry that's so haphazard and so it's only long hours and so much yeah. weak work is critical you know yeah yeah so i've got another question here um which relates to that so it's um Thank you for today, and sorry if this has already been covered, but I am wondering, in terms of a day-to-day -day basis, what do you do in your jobs at the moment, apart from having a rest? And how do. does this differ from when you started out with Doc and Roll? They don't want okay. to do what I'm doing today. It's the most boring job. I have to do a lot of accounting. Reporting. Reporting. And it's not, admin. you know, administration boring, jobs. Boring, boring stuff. Explain but, what you mean by reporting. Because so if you're not like, in the in the loop okay. of funding, yeah. you might so not know what that means. We need to report to our funders. So we have we are supported by the BFI funds. And okay. after the festival, National, uh, National Lottery, yeah, we need to uh, report all the, you know, uh, box office returns, all the pay people that we have in our festival, and as well explain how the festival went. But that is a part that we are doing the reporting. But as well, when you finish, you need to, you know, pay the directors, organize things with the cinemas, return films. So Pay it's everyone. a lot of pay everyone, pay your producers, pay your team, your Q&A host. host, your artists, your musicians. Your so PR team. It's a lot of work in administration. So that is not the good part or the fun part. But, you know, that's the reality that comes. And that's it. presumably, your, you know, the MBA in business administration is a big help in that. Absolutely. But yes. you don't need an MBA. You can figure everything. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. But what you need, for example, the MBA, what gives me is structure. like to treat the structure and as structure. well to give me an idea that how like developing festivals as a business, as a how like you be, you know, successful running the, like because I don't think some festivals they run as a, as a like, you know, the project is to be a company and a company that has different parts that makes this sustainable, that you have something created that maybe doesn't make money, but you have, you know, you are supported by, you know, in the ground by something stable and then you can grow. So that's how I so that helped me, you know, to have that in my, you know, as a studies. Yeah. You know, so that's a really so important. you have obviously funding, but you're also working on a business model. And that was yes. I wanted to link back to, you know, we when we advertised today, we talked about USPs or unique selling points. And they mm -hmm. might be a bit old fashioned, that language, but clearly Doc and Roll has a unique selling point which mm -hmm. makes that niche yours. And yeah. I know that there's some people here today who've got film festivals with, with the same thing. And presumably, Uche, Nollywood Film Club is going for the same thing. So yes. um, how in terms of like cynicism with a niche or passion? I think I know the answer here. But like, how much research did you go into finding that niche? Or was it just your passion and you were lucky? That's for Uche or for Vanessa? <laughs> That's quite a hard question. <laughs> So for, for for you for Uche or for us? For you, for you, for, for me. For, it's for you. Like the research column does all the research. He, like he's researching constantly. And this is something that is keep looking and looking and, and finding new things. And then this leads to the other things about he can explain more, right? 
Yeah, like I just said, I'm kind of not to repeat myself fully, but it's just to follow up from what I mentioned about the initial two or three years of building a program involved a heavy amount of research and very long days and that, like, you know, where Vanessa was dealing more with the inside or whatever it may be. And I was going off on crazy tangents, finding people to the point where I found somebody who created a PhD film in L.A., and they were absolutely delighted that I found them because they had no idea how to get the film into a film festival. Long story short, we had uh, the European premiere of it, and that film went on to screen across probably 25 or 30 um, film festivals and opened a lot of doors for the filmmaker. So I actually found this as a PhD project. You know, that's not listed anywhere, you know. That was a crazy rabbit hole I went down and I and I came out the other side with a fantastic film, you know, that and helped this woman yeah. uh, travel across from LA across Europe with the film, you know, which was about uh, hip hop and the internet and how uh, the hip hop artists of 20 to 15 years ago really used the network of the internet to get around the, the labels and create their own, their own, their own, their own kind of their own their own companies basically you know and not rely on, on record labels you know so um research is absolutely crucial because you need to get ahead of your competition and undermine your competition yeah. and be agile enough to get around your competition particularly if your competition has 25 programmers or five programmers uh and i'm one person doing 16 hour days so you got to be really clever and really sharp and really committed and like i said just going back to establishing relationships on skype uh, that really undermined a lot of established uh, programmers because they couldn't be bothered doing that because that's a lot of work. And just so, I, I, so to, I realize I slightly hijacked this question. So in terms of day to day, so like a week at the beginning when you were starting Doc and Roll, a lot of research, a lot of networking. Okay, what's a week look like now? Oh yeah, and uh, this week obviously it's all business, but you know. Yeah. It's, it's uh, not always like this. Maybe a week during the festival might be a useful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, to begin with, it's a basic, you know, you know, at the beginning of the day, answering emails, whatever they may be, and then uh, depending on how full the inbox is. Uh, so basically, in the lead up to the headline festival each November, our inboxes are slammed from August into November into December. It's what we're talking about reporting now. So there can be a lot of answering emails, and that uh, is of all varieties and all the different services and clients we work with to make the festival happen. But probably from now uh, in our calendar year, as Vanessa mentioned, a lot of admin, and a lot of reporting, but then uh, January is particularly our planning time because it takes a lot of time to plan the music uh, uh, festival screenings in July, August, September. And uh, apart from that, I'm always looking for films to put on to our VOD channel, which thankfully mm -hmm. you mentioned a lot. I launched that before COVID, before everyone jumped, jumped on that. Oh. So again, we were ahead of the game on that yeah. by a year. And that was another UK first in terms of the film festival being a UK first, but uh, that was a global first, the first TVOD that was dedicated to music documentaries. Uh, there are several people who followed in our wake, but uh, we established that in uh, very early 2019. Uh, a year and a bit ahead of the COVID lockdown when the BFI supported a lot of the 200 teams across the UK to set up their own players. So thankfully, yeah. we're here for that game. Mm -hmm. uh, right. so I'd love to hear more, but I'm running out of time. A quick one to Uche. So what's your week look like setting up Nollywood Film Club? So um, for now, we're still like a virtual um, film club where we screen and then we'll come together and we'll talk about it. So it's just like a weekly recommendation. But from next um, yeah, 2023, we want to take it to like physical spaces where we would at least like, like screen like a Nollywood film quarterly. So once physical events, once, once every quarter, so once every three months, and then we'll try as much as possible to have like the director or someone who works on the project be like there to do like a question and answer. So that's what we're working on and I'm looking forward to that. 
I'm taking all the tips from Colum and yeah. Vanessa <laughs> and I'm going to just Great. You know, thank you. So I'm moving to there's a couple of questions that are like looking at talent. And I just like want to preface these that you know, as I was listening to the talk, I was thinking, how much does researching the films cross over into producing the films? And there's a there's a question here, you know, there's also like you you start with the festival and then you move into sales, acquisition distribution and a streaming service yeah. so there's a question here from Sid Heather um, amazing and interesting talk thank you so much first question I'm going to come back to second is I'm currently looking at a new company that's focused on distribution of Kent-based projects what advice do you have for someone who wants to get into the world of acquiring and distributing niche feature films and then the, the other question is they're developing a music documentary what stage would they speak to a filmmaker about the idea to see if there's interest for a future festival? So I think it's sort of saying, as a maker, do you start to target your festival before you've made the film? And uh, do you only consider finished or near finished projects? There's a lot of questions there, sorry. Yeah. One about the distribution and one about makers and at what point they should approach you or a maker yeah. who's working with you. Yeah. Well, in terms of distribution, I think you should just obviously you need to uh, do a lot of research in terms of what type of existing companies are out there, what their uh, unique selling point is, uh, because there's a lot of distributors out there just in middle of the road indie films, uh, just like there are film festivals, um, which is good if you want to get your foot in the door. And I would advise anyone involved in looking to get into doing niche stuff first to start in the more slightly mainstream ones, the more established ones, because they have more opportunities. Mm. Um, yeah. Once you've learned what you can within there in the space of 18 months, you hit the road because after 18 months, they're going to lock you down and they're not going to train you. And you have to be really uh, careful with not getting stuck in a good job because you're looking for a great job. So you've got to keep moving um so that would be my advice there and once you have 18 months experience you find 18 months experience elsewhere or you go out on your own and you find some like-minded people who want to set up their own company and who have similar background to you and with all the research you're doing in terms of going to niche film festivals watching niche um events uh on online as well bring all that combined passion together and launch something yourself or go and find the company that you are looking for within that niche world. But definitely the established mainstream companies have a lot to offer on your initial uh, initial ground foundational you know, background. I think it's really, you said a lot about research. I think it's a really important point. And like, if even if you're not thinking about setting up your own company and you're a young programmer working with a venue, the, your uh, key to success is uh, as I might put it like archaeology, you know, but it's not, it's the opposite of archaeology. It's not the past, it's the future, but it's like, it's what's not easily and readily available. Yeah. And that's what's going to bring your audience in. Yeah. And to keep what other people are doing is keep so important. Eye, keep an eye it's on. like people like are sometimes like close on their own thing. It's so important to check what the cinemas are programming in general, what is the other festivals are doing, even like the festival not connected to you but just interesting thing because you learn from everyone and you learn from yeah. talking to people oh my god that that's interesting i can put that in my festival it's a completely different festival yeah. but there are things that are applicable for everyone so just keep an eye and, and just ask, check ask, in ask, and ask. ask a lot of questions you know you you just really want to ask a yeah. lot of questions without it without kind of badgering people. So you kind of, I, I would always advise in terms of any industry is to try to go to a lot of networking events. And if you're starting from scratch, to talk to people who are established and ask them what they're doing at the moment and ask them if they can be of any help, if uh, you can be of any help to them, which is a really great opener because, you know, you feel like you've got no background in anything, but at least you're opening your time up for a few hours a week to, to help them out. Maybe they're they're like, we've always got really long days. We've all got too much projects going on and everybody likes a little bit of help, if at all possible. But just that question opens a lot of doors because if you're willing to offer maybe a week of your time to somebody who's already established, they might say, look, 
thanks for the offer, but you know, it'll take me too long to train you up. So, uh, you know, I, but stay in touch, you know, because I will remember somebody who went that far and, and offered their services for free just to help me out because a workload is so much. And I think this works really well in terms of psychological, you know, and so you don't turn up at an event going, I don't know anything about this world. You know, what can I say to anyone who's established, you know, so you basically go and ask and listen is incredibly important to listen, you know, because a lot of people will go to events and they try to uh, fake it. And it's not a good idea to fake it and make it when in a networking event. That's a disaster. No, it's a, you know, because people can smell you a mile away, you know, it establish people. So you actually want to go and listen and take notes. Yeah. Make and, your, you know, your beginner status a virtue, but your grit and your perseverance is yeah. on offer. So. Yeah, because the last time anyone is established wants to hear a networking event is somebody who's bullshitting, you know. Yeah. Yeah, very useful advice. So uh, did we quite flush out? There's uh, a question which is similar from Roderick. Hi, really enjoying this talk. What advice would you offer anyone trying to break into the film documentary scene? That uh, looks quite a broad question. Yeah, it depends, it depends if you want to make film. Actually, is that making films, distributing films, or exhibiting yeah. films? Or but is this going to events? Going to events, to go to film festivals, going to the event, you know, to meetings and all uh, the things that if, you've done. If, it's if a lot of things happening. From a point of view, you really kind of want to establish a network of uh, people who are similar to you who might have made a five minute short, you know, and start on that level. We keep it simple. Yeah. And, right. uh, and meet, them in a, meet them in a pub or an art center or a library and, and like start to hang out, ask them some questions, ask them what did they learn in the process and what did they wish they know before they began. And those crucial points so that you avoid the mistakes they made, Yeah, you know, to, to make your journey shorter rather than having to go through all the mistakes that other people made. Yeah, this is so, it's so interesting and we've got no more time left. So is there anything tip wise say Vanessa, and you know, linking with that, so that we didn't really touch much on female under the radar documentarians. So, is that, but that's, you know, is there anything that you'd like to say or like any tips that for I want anyone more out there before we close? <laughs> I would love more, you know, female non or non binary, queer, people yeah, whatever, like all the minorities to, you know, to support them and having more music documentaries. That they, you know, that's what we have done during our festival. We brought half of the uh, program that that was touring was by female directors, and just help them and help them to to you know that this is a world that we can be in here that we are welcome, and also we can go and help them to go outside the UK and and pro and help them to you know to reach all the festivals. So yeah, it's just a journey that I want more, you know, minorities to take and it's yeah. enjoyable. Awesome. And, um, you know, we didn't get to talk much about the live music events. You said they were a little bit tricky, but obviously but, worth it. to do. And then the DJ sets and that whole sort of wraparound vibe sounds like so exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, Colm, whether you'd say anything like, do, the, do you have to pay for the, rep, for the sounds on the DJ set if it's a private event? Just a sort of simple... Very basic, well, well, I mean, it depends. The, the venue that you're using will have a license for music being played already. Mm -hmm. mm. So that's what you need. And then it will be. Yeah. So they're essentially music venues or bars and they already have that license with PRS. Yeah. Which is the license okay. body for, for playing music within your venue. And then it's and is there any final comment you'd like to make in terms of tips or just anything from your experience? I mean, I know we talked earlier about the advantages of being an outsider so, yeah. yeah we talk about difficulties but there are sometimes advantages right oh absolutely because you see things from a different perspective and that can make your conversation much more interesting in a networking event you know just simply yeah. and basically perseverance gets you everywhere you know mm -hmm. because somebody else with a mediocre idea who has more perseverance than you will get ahead of you if you don't show up. You got to show up. Yeah. So you got to go out on rainy nights up to the other side of the city, wherever you may be, to try and meet somebody who may be there and may not be there. And if they're not there, don't get disappointed and go out the following week and go to those events again. And you will hook on to exactly who we're looking for eventually. So basically, show up and keep yeah. showing up. And challenge the people that they think like they are running a business for a long time. 
because maybe they are like too old and you have new ideas. So it's like always and fresh, you know, to bring new ideas because sometimes Absolutely. the film festivals that have been running in this way and this is the way it's run. It's like, maybe not. Maybe there is well, another way. To it. There are several film festivals fallen by the way in the last five years because they didn't have business plans. So yeah, so it's just like challenge people, challenge your ideas. Yeah, be, that's it. Be challenge knowledge. yourself. Really. Challenge yourself, but challenge be yourself. knowledge, you know, prepare yourself. Yeah. Obviously, but yeah. don't, don't, don't go challenging the established people until you're at least a year in the game. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. brilliant. So, we've run out of time. I just want to there's a little comment at the end from Amit. Thanks, everyone. This talk's been very encouraging. I'm a female director developing a music documentary and hope to share it with everyone soon. Do um, put it in the chat yeah. quickly before yeah. we close. Yeah, and we can thank people. everyone. <laughs> yes, people get in, in touch with us. Yeah. Just my email, Vanessa at Doc and Roll Festival or column at Doc and Roll Festival .com, And we get in touch with really early stage of uh, music documentaries. Because so, we're involved in, as ex executive producers as well. To yeah. Find funding. So that's Help another people, key. you know, to guidance from the beginning and not making the mistakes that other people that we have seen is yeah. doing. Or so the mistakes so that we made. Yeah. So, you know, because we yeah. produced a music documentary five years ago that went on with Sky Arts uh, last year. Yeah. So. So I think also just to close, the fact that you combine your filmmaking experience with the film programming and actually, yeah, the business with the like real vision for marginal voices and diverse, it's just like a perfect combination. And the fact that you're in the same screen, again, suggests that kind of collaboration and that kind of combination of talents and skills and passions maybe that's another tip for anyone out there and maybe Uche you know get an intern get a team because you can go narrow-minded if you're on your own so on your own mm. uh, yeah. you really need to have somebody there for the very bad uh, long days when you feel like you yeah you need somebody to pick you up and that's crucial thank you I'll definitely consider that <laughs> I just can't afford to pay anybody now, but <laughs> Brilliant. we'll figure it out. <laughs> so thank you all so much. There are some recommendations that were on our newsletter, but I'm just going to close with them. There's a free um, shorts program curated by Doc and Well Film Festival that gives you a really great like experience of the range and diversity of these uh, different under the radar groups that have been promoted through the festival. So thanks for the inspiration and the pragmatism. And thanks so much, Uche, for the interview. And right. see Thank you all you. next month. Thank you. Thank you.